Thank you very much, Andre, for your very uh, enlightening and uh, comprehensive, you know, presentation uh, and your your uh, reflections on how complicated the problem is, and your uh, information on how Presidential Library of Russia is trying uh, to cope uh, with this uh, completely new uh, situation. When listening to you, uh, while listening to you. I recollected, you know, verses by Vladimir Mayakovsky, who wrote uh, in early 1920s, communism is the youth of the humankind, and the, it is youth uh, to build communism. <laughs> so young people like, like you <laughs> are, to, are, to, uh, are to, you know, save our, uh, you know, global memory for the future generations and to, uh, to take lessons uh, from, uh, from all our mistakes, at least. Thanks, thank you again. And now uh, it is tuned to, it is, it is tuned for um, uh, Dr. Ramesh Gaul uh, to continue uh, reflections on this uh, very complicated uh, and integral, you know, topic uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, information preservation. Uh, uh, in 2011, uh, there was first ever a UNESCO conference on uh, information preservation and uh, Ramesh Gaur participated in, in, in that event and uh, Moscow Declaration on Digital Preservation was adopted at that conference and this was the first ever more or less, uh, you know, ramified uh, document describing uh, and analyzing and structuring uh, the problem of information uh, preservation. Since then, many steps uh, uh, were made uh, to approach uh, the better decisions on how to, uh, to preserve digital information, although uh, the scope of problems is uh, enlarging with uh, everyday coming. So, uh, uh, Ramesh, uh, now this, you know, virtual space uh, to speak is yours. Thank you, Dr. Tunjip. Uh, let me first uh, thank and congratulate you and Professor Raab for bringing us Thank you, Dr. Tunjim. Can you hear me? So, uh, let we me can hear you, Ramesh. You. Yeah, yeah. Let me congratulate you and Professor Raab for bringing that to India. I think this is the first time uh, uh, India has this conference, uh, if I believe. So, uh, thank you very much. So, let me start uh, my presentation, which I will be speaking on. Uh, accessing heritage during this global uh, COVID-19 uh, and particularly I will be presenting Indian uh, scenario, how India dealt with this particular situation. So uh, just now you have a presentation, excellent presentation from my colleague Dr. Andrew uh, who has uh, talked about web archiving. So here uh, my presentation will be uh, focused on uh, libraries and archives of heritage and documentary heritage. So before that, I just want to give you my background, like how I have been associated with uh, preservation uh, uh, and access to the cultural heritage over the last over 15 years uh, as a dean and director at uh, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts. I think is one of the premier research institute uh, in the field of art and culture in India promoting and preserving Indian cultural heritage. And uh, as a head of the uh, resources here at IGCF since 2004, I have been uh, looking after the work. In 2017, I was appointed as a, a, expert, a national coordinator for expert group of memory of the world program in India. And later in 2018, I was appointed as an international advisory committee member for UNESCO memory of the world program. 
I also uh, represent a program advisory committee of IFLA on global cultural heritage. Besides, I have been engaged in various projects like setting up of International Center on Documentary Heritage in South Korea. And I also uh, associated with Digital Dunan project of uh, China for five years as international expert. Apart from that, uh, in South Asia and other East, uh, Asian countries, I've been very closely working. Uh, my, my background, uh, with my background and my association with all those things, uh, like just we, we, we are hearing about dev archiving, but in, in, in recent South Asia, we are still wondering that our library archives and cultural heritage is still not on the web. So the, the step, the advanced level of uh, web archiving comes later. Uh, we are still, and, and one thing, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry to say before my presentation that my experience says, although we have several programs, uh, IFF program, UNESCO Memory of the World program, and IFLA is also doing a lot of uh, activities and programs, but somewhere in South Asia is still, uh, we have we have been see, seen we have been seen uh, a kind of deterioration in terms of preservation and access to the uh, particularly libraries and archives heritage and cultural heritage in in, in real sense. So somewhere I think the the programs like IFF and the uh, MOB all have to come little little uh, uh, forward in really taking up issues uh, which, which are not directly linked with the uh, European countries and the Western world, because here still the technology is not at that level and, and there is a need to uh, have some kind of, uh, like even when we talk about disaster risk reduction policy for information preservation, hardly that exists. So uh, I think there is there is a lot to be done. but. Uh, I, I, I do agree with everybody that, uh, uh, and, and uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Ernesto, uh, uh, Assistant UNESCO Director General said, that now more than ever people need culture. Culture makes us resilient and it gives us hope, it remains us that we are not alone. That is why uh, UNESCO and other IFLA bodies are having several programs. So we need to understand the importance of culture and, and the libraries and archives as a, as a repository of cultural heritage. Uh, we have different kind of heritage, but here uh, I'm focusing more on uh, documentary heritage. Uh, I'm not uh, talking about tangible or natural heritage. I I'm focusing some part of intangible cultural heritage and mostly documentary heritage in, in, in India. When we talk about the Indian scenario, how documentary heritage and uh, other heritage is archives in India, Ministry of Culture is, the, is one of the uh, uh, most important organizations uh, under which there are 45 institutions. Uh, which have been divided into three categories. And the uh, uh, organization, we, we call it knowledge organizations, responsible for documentary heritage preservation and access. Uh, that include uh, National Library, National Archive, uh, then number of other uh, uh, Nehru Memorial Library, Rampur Raza. So there are several of libraries and archives comes under this knowledge organization. And the second category of organizations which deals with tangible cultural heritage, uh, including Archaeological Survey of India and various museums. And third category of intangible cultural heritage uh, is school, uh, organizations like National School of Drama and uh, uh, IGNC, which I represent, and various Western John and Eastern John cultural centers and, and several other organizations. So that way, uh, most of the cultural heritage is being uh, managed by the 45 cultural institutions under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. But besides that, there are several other institutions like state archives, state libraries, state and, and state level museums, and also some universities are having uh, special collections or rare, rare and art collections, which also uh, they have manuscript libraries and other collections. I estimate India possesses about 10 million manuscripts, and it is it is it is the vast uh, heritage uh, of various kind of photographs, prints, and and and, and, and uh, non-print material. But when we talk about preservation and access to the cultural heritage, there are certain uh, important jobs to be done. We need to collect it, store it, and organize it uh, for the posterity. So in that collection and 
organizational indexing play a very important role. So first thing we should have people able to locate and identify where, where that particular heritage exists. Uh, we have some some success in that area, but uh, still, it's, it's still there are a number of things to be done. When we talk about digitization and digital preservation of Indian cultural heritage, I think long way to go. I will give you some idea like how some initiatives have been taken up, but it's still it's a long way to go uh, in this direction of uh, having uh, several good programs and preservations of, uh, of these kind of material. When we talk about multilinguality in the in the context of uh, cultural heritage, particularly documentary heritage, as I mentioned, 10 million manuscripts have been uh, estimated in India. Out of that, 4.3 million have been already catalogued, and out of that, about half a million we have already digitized are available on uh, in our uh, IGNC building. Now, talk about multilinguality of these manuscripts. These manuscripts are in various ancient scripts uh, which are known to hardly very few select scholars like Brahmi, Prakriti, Sharda. Uh, uh, these, these scripts, ancient scripts are known to very few scholars. So what will happen? These 10 million manuscripts are having values when somebody can decipher it, somebody can understand it. But after some time, when nobody will be available to read these manuscripts, what, what is the value of that knowledge which nobody can decide for it? So I think this multilinguality also need to be taken care of because none of these scripts is, have been deciphered and we don't have that kind of uh, decipher in terms of technology means development of OCRs. These are still uh, being read in, in form of images like although we have digitized six, about 600,000 manuscripts but somebody has to read it in that particular script in the image format only. So the technology has not uh, has solved that multilinguality and, and then access is, uh, is, is, a, is something different. When we talk about interoperability of these cultural heritage, I think that is a long way to go. There are there are no copyright and ownership rights on these uh, manuscripts and other resources, but still we are not able to have a consensus. Like we have 600,000 manuscripts, but many of the manuscripts we cannot give to somebody else because there are certain kind of agreements signed with other manuscript libraries which we have collected. So these copyright ownership rights also need to be looked into in the right context. So, now I would like to bring to your attention about this uh, COVID. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, from Tanzania has very well presented his thought. I'll just give you brief information. Uh, we have uh, about 3.1 million cases reported so far. Out of that, 2.4 million have already been cured. So about 700,000 uh, active cases are there in India in, the, in terms of COVID. We are slowly, slowly moving towards uh, opening up various uh, uh, institutions like uh, Till uh, July, our all uh, monuments, uh, museums, everything was closed. But from July onwards, the monuments have been opened. Libraries and archives are still closed. So during this particular COVID-19 pandemic, what, how, what was the situation? How people were uh, having access to those cultural heritage? Like uh, you need to have remote access because when you are in, under lockdown, the access should be available at your door, doorstep. So uh, I just want to give you some background, like how, how we are able to solve that problem or are we capable of handling that kind of situation? Definitely when we talk about working from the home, uh, we have been working from the home, but key issue was that is that cultural heritage, documentary heritage accessible uh, on internet anywhere, anytime? My answer is no. Uh, why? Because uh, most of the libraries and archives in India are still looking for a proper digital archiving system. Number of digitization projects have been undertaken, but still, if I like, I am talking about 10 million manuscript. Now, even 1 million manuscripts are not available on internet to access the people. You see, people have to, like, we have digitized 600,000 manuscripts, but you still people have to come to the, uh, the uh, permissions of the IGNC to access those manuscripts. So in that context, if we talk about, uh, there are few exact uh, organizations, like there is a Delhi State Archive or Asiatic Society Mumbai. Some piecemeal approaches are there. So when we talk about complete access to the 
digital libraries and archive cultural heritage documentary heritage answer is no we have not able to serve the people in during this corona now let's talk about other aspects like it may be uh, issue related to entertainment like when people want to have glimpses of a virtual museum uh, people want to have the certain kind of walk throughs or or real use of uh, augmentation reality virtual reality or immersive technology in showcasing our uh, monuments our museum objects our museum archival holding i think still we are lagging behind in making that presence felt so uh, when we talk about having access to the cultural heritage during lockdown my answer is that people unable to get access a researcher unable to get the data from the national archive researcher unable to get the the uh, various kind of archival material from the archives researcher unable to get the various kind of uh, uh, documentary heritage available in in form of visuals or photographs over the internet so we are not very well prepared uh, indian cultural institutions are still not having that that a position to provide access, online access to the documentary heritage cultural heritage in this country i think uh, this is something of concern there are number of initiatives there are number of projects have been initiated there is a digital library of india where million books were digitized some textual work has been digitized some uh, textual uh, rare books have been digitized copyright uh, away from copyright books have been digitized but when we talk about having a network of all cultural institutions and having a union catalog of all the resources available in the libraries and archives answer is no we don't have any union catalog which can provide the information about which particular resources available in which particular libraries and archives when we talk about having a, a full tax access to the manuscript answer is no and when we are talking about having a full tax access to the photographs the music audio but there there are few initiative but these are not enough as per the vast heritage available in country like india and and this is this is i can say with the confidence about the other south asian country also because i have been very extensively working and uh, uh, discussing with these issues we have some initiative in the direction of digital preservation of cultural heritage but we don't have any concrete plan we don't have any any kind of uh, 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 process i can see indira gandhi national center for the arts which i represent uh, which is the largest organization in terms of preservation of indian cultural heritage it was set up in 1987 as a autonomous body of ministry of culture we have several initiatives in terms of preservation of uh we have nine uh, regional center we operate through so number of centers in this direction and the kalanadi uh, resource which 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 i am resource center which i am heading is having most valuable resources available with us as i mentioned we have about 600000 manuscripts in digital format uh, in jpeg jpeg and pdf files uh, we have uh, 4000 rare books all digitized we have more than 100000 visuals we have a number 45 collections of uh, various uh, categories like uh, on museum uh, on music on on literature and these personal collections are from the various uh, scholars like you you know uh, ak kumar swami the great uh, art historian so we have personal collection of ak kumar swami we have dance collection of one of the eminent uh, dance scholar mohan khokar uh, we have a uh, sculpture from various uh, collections of uh, uh, lance din we have photographic collection of eminent photographer 19th century photographer raja dindya we have photographs of kato vensho we have paintings of elizabeth bruner so we have such a valuable material uh, when we talk about digitization everything has been digitized and available but we are unable to put it online so the people can make it accessible over the internet now as i was i was talking about the manuscripts uh, manuscript uh, uh, this national mission for manuscript was launched in 2003 and under that i, I have already clearly mentioned when we talk about preservation and access to manuscript a large amount of work has been done by uh, national mission for manuscript and igncm as i mentioned 4.3 million manuscripts have been cataloged uh, catalog is accessible over the internet over uh, 81 million Uh, folios of the manuscripts have been conserved uh, about uh, as i mentioned 600000 manuscripts have been digitized over 85 uh, 
of books have been published, a number of catalogs have been published, various uh, training workshops been, has been organized, various kind of uh, uh, workshop in the, in the form of uh, various kind of program. And, 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 and to, uh, uh, to, to enhance the uh, presence, online presence of IGNCA, we have a number of projects which, which I would like to uh, put to your attention and would like to show you that we have been doing number of uh, digitization in uh, multimedia project. And one of the very important project is the National Cultural Audio Video Archive. This uh, uh, was initiated in uh, 2018 and uh, under this project, we have already digitized and uh, digitally archived 30,000 hours of audio video recording. And it is free under open access. And our aim is to digitize about 300,000 hours of uh, audio video recording in the future and work is, is still going on. Uh, in IGNC itself, we have another 75,000 hours of uh, audio video recording which need to be put on this particular platform. So this is, this is, this is a recent initiative and we are moving in the direction of uh, preservation and access to audio video cultural uh, uh, material in form of this National Cultural Audio Video Archive database. Then another uh, important initiative we have done during this Kum festival last year, we have developed an app called Sangha Map, uh, which includes about 2,500 tracks featuring 40, 400 artists uh, in different languages. And these are uh, various kind of uh, strotas, suktas, slokas, and uh, dhuns, uh, like various kind of uh, uh, religious music or some kind of uh, uh, chanting uh, mantras and all those things. Uh, this is also available online. It is mobile app has also been developed. Then another important initiative we have uh, done, which is accessible, the creation of Vedic heritage portal. Vedas are considered the most ancient uh, literature in the country. And Vedas are considered uh, very, very important for Indian, Indian uh, uh, India and, in, and to provide a single window access to all the literature, all kind of resources on Vedic traditions, text, publication, and various kind of interpretation in English and uh, Hindi, we have we have launched this Vedic heritage portal, which is accessible uh, to uh, various uh, uh, people uh, over the internet. Uh, portal was launched in 2019 and, and, and had, having very large popularity in terms of that. Besides, there are there small project where we have launched some kind of multimedia DVDs and, and uh, some kind of multimedia uh, programs like Sanzabur uh, Brothers Temple, we have launched a DVD. We have about 200 DVDs uh, available on, and we have also several films and documentaries on various cultural heritage aspects, uh, like we have in Geet Govind, we have on uh, Devanarend or uh, Dasi, we have uh, uh, on Agni Karnia, we are coming up with a DVD on that. So that was the access to the resources. But during this COVID-19, one thing I can say with the proud, we have converted our all regular programs because IGNC is having several uh, programs every day in form of seminar, conferences, lectures, and uh, fairs, festivals. So we have converted almost all the programs in online mode. Like we have started a uh, IGNC a Facebook series, live series, under that uh, uh, folk artist, uh, the musician, the archaeologist, the history, art historian, everybody is speaking in this particular platform. Apart from that, we have converted our exhibition into virtual exhibitions. Uh, several exhibitions have been launched. Virtual exhibition has been launched. We have converted our seminar into webinars. We have converted our book discussion into virtual discussions. We have converted all our online memorial lectures into online lectures and all, all kind of like uh, 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 fair and festivals and uh, Kavi Darbars and so, so many every day one and other program is taking place. So we can say that we have not disappointed our Indian community, uh, uh, people, uh, artists and uh, art lovers in terms of keeping silent. We have we have, and in several other Ministry of Culture institutions in India also have done wonderful work in, in providing various kind of resources. This is the one area which uh, we can say that we have done successfully reaching out the people and, and entertaining them, informing them, and providing various kind of value additions during the lockdowns. 
uh, one last thing which is very important I would like to highlight here that public libraries play a very important role. It may be information preservation and access, it may be uh, in memory of the world program, or it may be access to all kind of cultural heritage. I think a long ways to go in this direction. We have currently about 46,000 public libraries and we need minimum minimum 400,000 library to serve 133 crore people uh, uh, in India. So in this direction, there are several efforts to be done and we need to have more public libraries in India. And uh, recently, uh, our prime minister is very keen that uh, optical fiber connectivity is reaching out to Blazes and Blaze Panchayat. So we may, we may have 2.45 lakhs uh, Blaze Panchayat library, public library system to stanter uh, this, this particular thing. Uh, I will try to finish in my, uh, my time. Uh, the, the last thing which I want to, last two slides I want to conclude and I will say that this cultural heritage belongs to the humanity. And uh, it, you cannot restrict it in the boundaries of a particular community or state or country. So, like UNESCO, so all programs are in this direction. But somewhere uh, during this last uh, decade, uh, it has been felt that there are certain kind of misconceptions, there are certain kind of mindset. Now people are confused with the internet. People are start believing that everything is available on the internet. See, internet can provide you access to those things which are already accessible or you have already uploaded it. So I think somewhere down, the importance of libraries and archives have been reduced. I think we need to do something to enhance the importance and we need to educate people about the role and importance of libraries and archives in preservation and access to the, the cultural heritage. We need to have a sustainable framework with all elements uh, for uh, to achieve the uh, SDG goals and also to sec secure a bright future because culture play a key role in the sustainable development of the society. We need to bring together all stakeholders in archives, museum, libraries, and we need to ensure that they should work in, in, in tandem and they should ensure that like every media has certain life. It may be microfilm, it may be uh, photograph, it may be glass plate negatives, it may be paper or it may be palm leaf. After some time, these materials will, will be vanished. So it is the right time that this should be digitally preserved. And for that, we need a digital preservation programs and policy, which is lacking in many South Asian countries. Uh, and definitely, we are not very good in that. Cultural heritage is a key for inclusive growth. That need to be educated to all the policy makers and planning. And uh, in the end, I would like to uh, give some recommendation which, which might be uh, uh, useful in, in this. But before that, one thing which I want to tell you, even in UN's SDG, it has been clearly spelled out the various culture has role in sustainable development goals. So I think somewhere we we need to link uh, those uh, cultural heritage with this uh, UN SDG goals. We, we have been talking about, but on the ground, on the on on the on the plane, or in the working, it is not visible. It, it is very good in the documents. It is very good laid, uh, very good definitions, very good uh, uh, programs have been laid down. But practically, these programs are not being implemented. So somewhere, I think we need to ensure it may be IFAP, it may be UNSDG, it may be UNESCO Memory of the World Program, UNESCO ICH, any, any such program, they need to be translated into the reality. And that that once that happens, only then we can achieve these objectives which we are talking. For that, we need to have some kind of advocacy, some kind of some kind of some kind of awareness, education to the policy makers, to the planners. They should understand the importance of uh, these these programs and policy, and they should translate into the action plan. They should provide proper funding. They should provide a proper platform to to have these kind of program in place. And uh, basically, uh, we have lot of lot of um, material available in our uh, our 
manuscript in form of manuscript on visuals or photographs somewhere i think there is one more mindset that copyright issues are also misinterpreted we have not taken those copyright ownership rights in the right context so i think we also need to look into that that when when, when we are planning to put something under open access because i strong supporter of open access and we can only achieve the sustainable uh, development goal or we can only achieve that objective that cultural heritage be be belongs to the humanity when we will be able to put it on under open access on the uh, in the public domain so people can access to that so in in, in this this context i have uh, three recommendation uh, because uh, uh, libraries archives both in public and private domain contain very valuable uh, knowledge base to Indian cultural tradition, knowledge system, intangible cultural heritage, and other documentary heritage for the posterity. This material should reach out to interested scholar worldwide in an easily online accessible format with the help of digital technology. And for that, I think it is it is an important need. Uh, I'm talking this in context of India, but this may be applicable to uh, many other countries to set up a consortium of documentary heritage institutions involving all stakeholders on the basis of private-public partnership model, along with creation of special funds for digitization and digital archiving of libraries and archives to explore the knowledge available in these resources to utilize the same for sustainable development of the mankind. Why I'm setting public-private partnership because government can never have that kind of funding and opportunities to do all these activities. Another thing, the the big technology giant like India is considered IT superpower, but that at best brains works in uh, Infosys or TCS or in Microsoft or in IBM, not in government institutions. So I think those public-private partnership is very important. Second important thing, we don't have any disaster risk reduction policy. Safeguarding documentary heritage in disaster situation by developing disaster risk reduction policy. Like uh, during this flood, every year we, we lose a lot of libraries. It may be in Kerala flood or in Bombay flood or in, in, in Chennai. We lost a lot of valuable heritage, documentary heritage. So we need to have a, uh, and, and there are several cases worldwide. It may be uh, terrorist uh, attacks or it may be a war-like situation. So we need to have a disaster risk policy for cultural heritage. And, and last thing which I want to uh, propose that after digitization to develop a centralized digital repository on Indian documentary heritage for universal access to uh, and digital preservation of documentary heritage. Because I, I strongly believe like this 10 million manuscripts which I am talking to you are in different scripts. Many people outside India also know those scripts. If we able to upload those 600,000 manuscripts available with us. Many scholars working in US and European, many Indian Asian study centers, they will be able to decipher these manuscripts. And then we will be able to know these, these manuscripts which are on architects, on uh, alternative medical science, on uh, astrology, on astronomy, on mathematics. So somebody can decipher and find out there may be some treatment to the disease like Corona or COVID-19 because alternative medical science of India was very, very strong and very well established. So I think we need to look into this in ancient knowledge system. And, and, and I, I hope a program like IFAF and uh, our other international programs will look into that. With these words, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rao and IFAF uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my some of my scattered thoughts because I try to mix up many things, but my ultimate aim of this presentation is to create an awareness that long way to go to really provide universal access to documentary heritage uh, in India and other, other South Asian countries. So with these words, I will stop share my uh, uh, screen and I will come back to the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kunji. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ramesh, uh, for your very interesting, instructional, you know, uh, comprehensive and, uh, I would say, passionate uh, presentation. Uh, much, uh, it's obvious that uh, much has been done that can be a, a subject of, uh, of pride. Uh, uh, 
your recommendations, uh, I noted that your recommendations is addressing more or less Indian government. Can you reformulate it uh, so that it can be relevant to uh, all, all other countries as well? Sure, I will do that. I will send it revised one. Okay, okay. Uh, now, Sir. Karthik? I think. Uh, is there any problem? No, sir. No, my connection was failed for. Oh, okay. uh, now it is restored. Uh, yeah, just Kuzmin, just I would like to mention that we have 10 minutes at our disposal. Yeah, 10 minutes, you know, you also want to, want to, you always want to limit ourselves, you know, we want to talk, you know, why, why it is your care, you know, how long we are going no, to... No, 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 I, I, I am telling you, it is up to you to decide. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. I told, I told that, yeah, I might much kinder than you are. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have heard, you know, three wonderful presentations, and now I would invite, I would like to invite you to ask questions to each other and also I would uh, I would like to invite our audience you know to ask questions uh, from our uh, speakers uh, please yeah if, if, if you remember if you remember we asked the participants to post their uh, questions in the chat box they have already posted so I think you can ask each speaker to respond to the questions that have been posted already in the chat. Aha, uh -huh. okay. This is another mode, you know, of chairing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you held, you held so many conferences online, you know, since February, non-stop every day, one by one, non-stop. So, uh, okay, I completely obey you, you know. Uh, so who will start the first, you know, Andre? Maybe you start the first to answer questions you're going okay. from. Chats. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I've got two questions from the chat. Uh, first one from Ramon Arcazan. Uh, uh, have you encountered efforts toward uh, historical revisionism? Uh, uh, for myself, I have uh, not studied information sources because I'm more technician, but uh, colleagues uh, from our organization, other organization face manipulations related to photographs and uh, archival documents relating to the Second World War. Also, this was discussed at the government level and our library together with the National Archival Agency launch a project that uh, demonstrates a complete selection of digital copies of uh, archival documents related to this period. This is done so that everyone can check the original documents and verify the accuracy of any information. So I can share the link to this project, and this is a project to be used as a proof project for all project all manipulations. Uh, also, we've got a question uh, from uh, Universidad Nacional. Uh, it's about contact. Yes, sure. As I said, uh, our library is still in the process of developing a uh, program of web archiving, but we are ready to share our knowledge. So I can leave my contact and we can be in touch and we can share every, every experience we have gained. We'll be glad to. Thank you. Mm, I think this is all questions for me. If you have any else, you can ask. Okay, uh, Andre, uh, have you answered all your questions? Yes, I have answered all my questions. Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now it's uh, it's the turn of uh, Ramesh Gaul to answer questions he got from the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kulim. So there is a question. Uh, how do you think one can rebuild 
people lost their libraries over the last decade in favor of the internet as information source? Is there even a ray of food to re regain such a trust? Uh, this is a question uh, raised to me, the first question. My answer is that uh, I think there is certain kind of uh, misconception about libraries and internet. Internet is a very useful platform and it provides a lot of information, but internet provides only the information which is people are putting on the internet. Another important thing, people are very used to Google. Like uh, people don't know that Google or any standard search engine does not index more than 15 to 20 percent back contents. So rest 80 to 85 percent back contents you cannot even search through Google. And internet has so many informations. It is not necessary every information is authenticated or every information is relevant for you. The libraries and archives are the repository of the uh, scholarly and the information which is benefit for beneficial for the society. It is, it is, it is created by uh, eminent scholars and the researcher and the people, uh, art, artists and all, all, all most respected people. So there is no comparison between internet resources which are created by anybody without even a justification. That is the one reason why libraries and archives are important. Another important thing is that we, we, are, we are talking about uh, a society like in last few years uh, we are facing look close down and we have been facing this uh, uh, we are we are on online in virtual space ask how many people are happy with total virtual space they need a mix of environment hybrid environment and another important thing even to search on internet like who are the best people to guide you about indexing and abstracting these are the libraries so libraries are were relevant and are relevant and will be relevant. Only it's a matter of making people understand, making people realize that what library can offer you, like we, we talk about uh, quality education and quality resources. Ultimately, every teacher, every faculty, every student is depend on the library resources rather than internet resources. So uh, I think only only question is that those policy makers, the educator, the, the uh, academicians, they, those who use library, they know about importance of the library. Unfortunately, the people who manage the library or archives, they don't understand. So our real job is to make them understand how important is the role of libraries in, 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 in preserving the, uh, the cultural heritage for the posterity. And, 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 and I think it's not a very difficult task. Only thing is that uh, we need to come together. These programs we are talking about, IFAP or uh, all kind of national international programs. The people who are managing these programs, they have to have some kind of action plan to uh, create an awareness and education. So uh, these are my thoughts about uh, uh, in cre creating awareness about library. There is another question. Somebody is asking about various reports at IGNC. Uh, See, uh, we have documents or uh, archival material in different forms. Uh, most of our material has been digitized. But unfortunately, due to certain uh, uh, lack of uh, funding for a good ar archival system or uh, due to certain copyright, uh, we are unable to put it on internet. Only uh, we have on internet is this uh, 30,000 hours of audio video archival material and Vedic heritage portal. Rest of our uh, 600,000 manuscripts are digitized but available only in the server and uh, local DVDs, etc. Similarly, we have thousands of photographs and we have thousands of paintings. And uh, so all these repositories have been cataloged but not uh, accessible over the internet. So if suppose somebody has to come to IGC and they can get the copies or somebody can request a copy, but they cannot get a full text or full copy available on internet. So in that way, a repository uh, are having uh, just uh, some repositories are available, but not all. In terms of our videos and multimedia presentation and films, the complete listing is available on IGNC website. If you want to have any 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 multimedia video walkthrough or Brothers Temple or on Dasi traditions, 
और ऑन वेरियस काइंड ऑफ इंडियन कल्चरल रामलीला और रामायण और महाभारत वी हैव ऑल दो डीबीटीज अवेलेबल ऑन सेल टू फॉर वेरियस पीपल विच विच दे कैन एक्वायर इट so i think these were the two questions i had come across uh, rest uh, uh, i am not able to see any other question directly raised to me uh, but one thing or last thing which i want to uh, tell about to this uh, uh, reservation and access to the culture doctor you know my doctor yeah that uh, as i mentioned that we have very good programs and policy i think somewhere like i am representing india in, in terms of unesco uh, memory of the world program last two years it is difficult for me to make people understand about the program even in the government in the in the uh, even libraries the program is meant for the libraries uh, preservation of documentary heritage but no librarian in this country knows about this program uh, how to implement how to submit a dossier what is the importance of registering in a national register or international register so i think biggest job is to do lot of awareness uh, of advocacy for promoting these programs and making people understand the importance of these programs maybe mob or ifap or uh, ics or any other program okay uh, okay ram ramesh uh, Can I conclude? You know, or you want to say anything else? Yeah, yeah that's my that's a, my last comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, now I would like to know if someone has another questions to our speakers, or has uh, wants to say something additional to what we have we have heard. I think Refer want to ask some question. Uh, if to me i've got a question from two people general questions please from um therese if i could read that for you please um in your research or experience have you encountered ways to address challenges in documenting preserving information especially in places with unequal access to information technology well, rachel this question is to whom to me or uh... it, it is to the sessions presenters i have a second question perhaps professor ramesh if you want to consider this one also how can archives play a role to preserve evidence of covid-19 and experiences as it now forms part of our history this one is from yakuda toy unesco yeah uh, so uh, your second question first see basically uh, it may be recent information it may be past information or present information archiving is very important because that information preserved for posterity because uh, take example i raised the question that uh, we are losing so many languages if he he, he can document those languages uh, and there are example when people have uh, there, is, there is a extinct language and a one person who started the movement and uh, learned from the documentation available in the archive of that country and he educated his uh, family then society and then community and that language was again alive similarly when we talk about covid 19 i think uh, that th this pandemic is so crucial because we have never seen that kind of pandemic so each and every information should be uh, uh, archived and now luckily we have an advantage because we are in a digital world so we need not to collect each and every piece of paper or digitize it now it is very very easy to digitally archive those information which is which is easily accessible in public domain so and once we archive it it is it need to be properly indexed or uh, that digital information is so much now we need to evaluate that information because sometimes uh, why why archives are important because archivists know how to evaluate that information every information is not correct 
every information about pandemic every information about treatment every information about the like people say so many things about it so we have to really analyze which information need to be archived because you cannot preserve each and every information about the archive like there there may be people uh, there may be repository on internet internet may be having like uh, he uh, andrew is talking about web archiving most of the information available on the internet may be available in the future also but when you search from internet you may be get, getting a fake information you may be getting a disinformation or misinformation but if you the archive it in a proper archive you will get only the authenticated and most relevant and most valuable information that is the importance and that is the role of a archive in preserving and documenting any piece of information and similarly that can be true in case of a, a pandemic uh, like covid 19 also uh, second regarding your uh, that was the uh, first question uh, Yes, the second one was in challenges in documenting or preserving information in places with unequal access, such as rural areas, for example. Uh, see, uh, I will give you an example. Recently, we have done a documentation of healing practices in India. So we did healing, uh, heal. We did a survey and documentation of healers who are spread in the rural areas, in hilly areas. We we took three states: um, Mizoram, uh, Arunachal, and Manipur. So there are several challenges. Like give you some example. First, to understand their local language when you are talking to the healer, he is speaking local language, and the survey. do not understand the local language so you either you have to take help from the local person or you have to learn the particular languages and many times they have different kind of fears like when we were surveying those healers somebody say people are taking our information but we are not getting any any benefit out of that so why we should share information from you to you so there are there are those kind of challenges and when you are recording their interviews Uh, when they are very suspectical or sus uh, they are suspicious about your objective so they are not uh, willing so you have to convince them and then also you have to go into the remote area rural area sometime they are not in favor of recording your interview sometime they only willing to give you some uh, written information or textual information which you can note it down so in any form of document it is depend upon what kind of documentation you are doing and then also how to really upload it on particular platform seeking their consent so in every documentation uh, of any any piece of knowledge system or archival material you have several challenges like take example we have 3000 photographs of a eminent photographer raja dindyal he did in 19th century he has taken several photographs but we don't know the background of the photographs so when we will be documenting that photograph we be, we have to make some kind of guesses that uh, when we are many of the uh, people in the photo may not be identified how to identify a person who has who was in 18th century or 19th century so every type of archival material have a different kind of challenges and and, and uh, definitely Uh, when we talk about the rural areas uh, it's still internet is a big issue where you cannot search you cannot verify something you will not depend upon your uh, knowledge and uh, resources available at their, that place thank you yeah this is rafael want to yeah andy you want to uh, respond to it something With regard to access to information, uh, the concept of our library is to give as much information as possible in the public domain, and uh, can say that during the epidemic, the use of our resources increased up to two times. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Gao, uh, what is with your internet traffic? What is your attendance to, to the resources during this COVID epidemic part? Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Rafael, you are raising hand. Please ask question. Yeah, Karthi, give access to Rafael. Ask a question. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, the digital medium is uh, 
a sustainable medium for archives, at least for long time archives, say 1000 years or so on. I have here, for example, the Tamil inscriptions in the Rajeshwara temple written 1000 years ago, 1000 years ago in stone. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine, but maybe my imagination is too short, that uh, archives in, in, in this time of 1000 years or 500 years or maybe 100 years uh, make any sense, at least if they are in possession of private companies. Uh, I see some, some sense uh, if they are on the basis of uh, uh, state, com sta state structures, like for example in Moscow, as you told us, or the United Nations, but not uh, for long time archiving in, in the hands of private companies, just because I think the private companies are, have a less uh, time of life as uh, uh, nations. Of course, nations can change altogether and destroy all their, uh, their records and so on in, in, in times of, of revolution, for instance. So the question is deeper. The question is about the, the, the sustainability of different media, stone, papyrus, paper, uh, or the digital. And the semantic question, if you think about the tradition of the Egypt tradition or the Indian tradition, for instance, who can read, for instance, the Tamil trans inscriptions now? Uh, only for specialists at that time, for a thousand years, maybe everybody could read it. So uh, there is um, uh, a semantic and pragmatic question that is uh, connected to time and to situation. If we want to give a message for one in 1,000 years uh, when we store, for instance, uh, um, uh, from, from our uh, different kind of, uh, uh, I, I cannot find a word in English now. Um, if, we, if we want to, to save uh, information for 50 or 100 or 100 or 1,000 years, uh, and this is an issue of archiving, long time archiving, then I see uh, a question that we, we should think about it. But also if the state is paying for that, it costs a lot of money, as you know, to make a transition from one system to the other in the digital medium. So uh, just to put it uh, in one simple sentence. Sh sh shall, I, shall I respond? I love to answer this. And this is the area uh, I'm also concerned because I fully agree with you. Digital media is not having any, uh, any fixed life. It is very uncertain. The server can crash in fraction of second. So that's why I always advocate that we should we should have always a multi format like uh, give you an example when we decided micro uh, decided the preservation of manuscript we have microfilm manuscript as well as digitized because if i believe microfilm is the long term preservation media and i always recommend that for most valuable archival material we should not just depend upon the technology we should also microfilm them because Every archival material, uh, like for, except even stone scription, have certain, after some time, it will also deteriorate. So we have to make copies, and these copies should be made in uh, microfilm and digital. And digital also, you can have some kind of multi, uh, like uh, lots of copies. You can have a mirror server and some, some uh, extra copies uh, in, in the backup and other things. So you have to have various options of, of preserving those contents. Yeah, That's why I always say you have to go to dual model. Second, about public-private partnership, I didn't mean that we should allow private companies to do it. What I was talking in my presentation that there are certain expertise which is available with the with the companies which are IT specialists. So you should collaborate. Uh, ultimately, the work should be done by the concerned libraries and archives, but we should have support of the best people in the industry. So that way, and, and there are a number of corporate houses, they have very happily give under corporate social responsibility, because every time you are having resource crunch, you are lack of funding. So you should, you should identify some big industrial houses who can donate money for preservation of cultural heritage. So that is the kind of private public partnership I was talking in my, my recommendations. So uh, I, don't, I fully support your views. We need to work on dual system of preservation, a microfilm as well as digital for long-term preservation. Mm. 
I also like, also like to tell that we cannot choose one physical medium for life. Uh, preservation is an ongoing process of maintaining the life cycle of information. So yes. we need to maintain it and to check of every every time. Yes. You need to regularly migrate or uh, transfer, uh, migrate from one version to another version, from uh, one, one uh, software to another software. It's a regular. Preservation is all about migration. This is very expensive. If you have a large, large, large collection uh, in the hands of the state, not of a private company, which can die from today to tomorrow, uh, I suppose in the States uh, have a long life for 100 years, for instance, or 200 years in case, then you have, a, you have to invest a lot of money to make the transition from one system to the other. Supposing that the, that the producers of these systems, the IT industry, uh, still has some kind of uh, documentation of that that allows you to, to make this transition. So I think this is a, a, an, another question of uh, uh, archiving in the digital age that we just think about it. I think indeed if you have different media, paper and stone or whatever or microfiche and so, it makes things less vulnerable. Uh, the philosopher, French philosopher, uh, Derrida wrote a very nice book on the mal d'archive. Uh, so what is against the archives is of course death. Archives are fighting against death, uh, destruction and so on. Uh, this is a very interesting piece of uh, literature about archiving and why uh, our, our uh, cultures are uh, uh, in, in, in a struggle against uh, the entropy, if you want, uh, of the medium or also of the semantic, of the understanding of what is transmitted. And I think this is a, a very interesting question also from the ethical point of view uh, that we should uh, put into our luggage uh, information ethics in, in this century. Yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, you cannot uh, uh, allow uh, others to take charge of your resources. Ultimately, uh, because uh, in, beside information ethics, authenticity is the another issue in digital world. Like when you digitize a particular uh, resource, how to maintain the authenticity of that? Is it real or original or it is a copy of original or not? So there are a number of issues in digital world. But when we talk about like uh, limitation of funds and limitation of resources, uh, either we have to be very selective. Uh, like take example, we have 4.3 million manuscripts identified. Now many of these manuscripts are in multiple copies. So you need not to preserve every copy. So you have, and, and also you need to make a selection that which one is the most valuable manuscript. So like when you have a limited resources, you have to be very selective in choosing the most valuable and most appropriate resource should be digitized first or digitally archived first or microfilm first. So in, in, see, funds play a very important role in this entire, entire process. But somewhere I think, uh, Libraries and archives are suffering because, uh, particularly in India, the state funding is not sufficient or the state funding is not enough to meet the challenges of preservation of this, 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 uh, this, uh, this large and vast cultural heritage. Like we have uh, a lot of knowledge systems, like it may be a Vastu Sastra or it may be uh, like healing practices I am talking about. So a lot of video documentation is required. So somewhere down the line, I strongly feel like somewhere there, there is a need, there is a scope that people, I, I see this is a like a good opportunity for the companies also, private companies also to enter in that domain. I am not against supposing private companies investing in documenting the healing practices in India and can create a database of healers in India. And that that is not just a kind of uh, business, it is also a social business, where you will, be, you will be preserving the dying art, because after these healers, the practices will not be known to anybody. So if suppose somebody, some private company come forward and document those healing practices, 
I will be the person who will, as a library professional and archivist, I will support it, that company that, yes, you are doing a social cause. At least you are preserving those healing practices from the extinction. So uh, maybe uh, I, I always differ. My aim is that things should be available to the people. It should be publicly accessible. And, and as, a, as a strong supporter of universal access, I always say that these practices should reach out all over the world to the entire humanity. Whomsoever is doing it, I don't mind it. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Kuzmin, I think uh, the time has come to close the discussion because it's too long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, after having heard everything from our speakers, from our audience, uh, their questions and answers to their questions, I, I recollected, you know, two very interesting, you know, terms that appeared uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, uh, reflecting, you know, uh, the problems of uh, uh, digital preservation. Uh, the first term was digital Armageddon. The, sec the, second, the second term was digital amnesia. That's uh, we are facing uh, at, uh, at the moment. Uh, the problem is very, very complex, uh, very complex, and uh, the complexity is growing uh, with every day coming because new technologies appear, the new technologies dictate, you know, new forms of, many, of handling the uh, digital uh, objects. And where, uh, where, uh, where is money, you know, to verify, uh, to verify, you know, objects after they have been transformed from one platform to another platform. Uh, you know from your personal experience that sometimes if we, we, we uh, try to, uh, to copy one simple word file into another platform, sometimes we get something absolutely unexpected. And we don't have time to, to even uh, verify our own you know, modest, you know, volume of uh, information. And how about the huge amounts of information in which, in which uh, the most difficult uh, uh, to me is how to, to select the most appropriate, the most valuable parts of information from digital uh, social media and other, you know, digital messengers. Uh, in Russia, for example, you know, the center of political discussions, the most interesting and critical political discussions, now uh, moved to, to these messengers, uh, Telegram, uh, Facebook, and others, you know, not in traditional media and not in traditional books. Uh, so, uh, of course, the risk that we will lose, uh, we lose memory, our collective memory and we will not be able to uh, use uh, the uh, necessary information in decades or in hundreds, uh, in centuries, like uh, Raphael uh, asked uh, absolutely uh, fair question. What will happen in, in 1000, you know? Digital objects, you know, we will, we, uh, that we are trying to preserve for eternity uh, cannot be put on shelves like books, you know, and to be considered that they uh, are preserved. They must be transformed, uh, uh, migrate from one platform to another platform with the verification of what we got in, uh, in the next uh, platform. Uh, who will select uh, this, uh, you know? Education, uh, education is degrading. Uh, where are so many philosophers who will be thinking and rethinking on what uh, should be preserved? So the problem is very complex, very integral, multi-leveled, multi-faceted, uh, multi-aspected. And uh, I think that we are very easy uh, going and easy thinking about this uh, problem. Uh, so uh, uh, the number of conferences uh, uh, is mainly reported to 
mainly devoted to listening reports on what is done and uh and what is done is much you know every institution uh does uh, uh very good uh, you know does very good work uh but totally uh the result is not uh uh satisfactory yet uh but st but still you know we must be we must be optimistic uh, otherwise uh, why we <laughs> we organize such conferences and such discussions of course to get positive response uh, and to learn from each other uh, so uh, uh this discussion is this discussion how should uh, how should we organize you know all work on, on digital preservation is endless is endless and uh, we should continue this and tomorrow tomorrow we are uh, we are to discuss other uh, two if our priority areas which is closely connected to digital uh, preservation it is uh, the use of information for development how how can we use and what can we use or what we have preserved for for future uh, happiness you know and uh, the second one is uh, information literacy because information literacy uh, presupposes uh, that our ability to preserve not only search information and uh, create information but also uh, preserve information uh, according to national laws you know according to uh, maintaining copyright uh, and uh, rights of owners and so on and so on in order not to be charged uh, uh, in crimes. Uh, so, uh, thank you again. Uh, for, uh, thanks uh, to all speakers for wonderful presentation. Thanks uh, uh, to audience and listeners for your patience and for your devotion uh, to understand the real huge problems which uh, are topical uh, and burning to if up. Uh, and I have to repeat that IFAP is an only intergovernmental program in the world that try to deal with the, with the complexity, with the complexity of uh, all burning problems of the humankind in, uh, in modern time. Thanks again. Yeah, I thank, I thank uh, Evgeny Kuzmin for chairing this session and also the speakers of first session and second session of the day, day one uh, for the very valuable presentations. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, all of you will join tomorrow at uh, 16 hours uh, India time again uh, to discuss further on the other as if have priority areas and in, in COVID times. And uh, I, I also just, I have a, uh, I, I would like to remind all speakers and the partners that today we have shared Hyderabad Declaration. So please go through it and give your initial comments because we are going to introduce this declaration formally in the Val Decree session day after tomorrow. So I request you, I know that uh, all of you have time but take some time at least to give your quick initial comments so that again after putting it in the uh, uh, formally in the in the in the well decree session again taking the inputs from the well decree we will uh, uh, come uh, get come back to you for your further inputs if there are any so please go through it and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining i thank all the speakers participants especially who have very patiently he listened to our uh, uh, presentations. And these presentations will be placed in the conference website, as I mentioned earlier, at the beginning, that the participants will have access to the uh, presentations through conference website. If they have any, if they want to discuss with the uh, speakers further or get clarifications, they can always do it through email. Thank you very much. And uh, just I ask Rachel to stay for, for just for one minute and uh,
and thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thank you, Dr. Kunji. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Oh, you are there. <laughs>